According to the Madison School District, 57% of school suspensions in 2019 were given to black students. Why is that? Large education gaps, poverty levels, and zero tolerance policies are huge issues that affect black education in Wisconsin. Today, we'll talk to one survivor of the school to prison pipeline and how they're using their story to help black youth in Wisconsin. But first, let's explore why race matters when we talk about education. The landmark 1954 Brown versus Board of Education Supreme Court case declared that racial segregation in public schools was unconstitutional. Even then, it wasn't until 1976 that federal judge John Reynolds issued a court order to desegregate Milwaukee's public schools. However, black students are still segregated by school policies. The 1990s saw ineffective zero-tolerance policies that led to the hyper-criminalization of Black students. Yet school districts still pushed for extra precautions. In 2007, Milwaukee Public Schools brought police officers, known as School Resource Officers, or SROs, to their district, which led to an increase in school arrests and citations. In Madison Metropolitan School District, Black students made up 81% of citations and 64% of arrests made by police between 2019 and 2020. Organizers and activists like Rudy Bankston worked tirelessly to address the criminalization of Black students and the pipeline between schools and the criminal justice system. Well, thank you for joining us today, Rudy. Thank you for reaching out <laughs> and invite me. <laughs> of course. We feel like you have a lot to share on this topic. So to get us started though, can you tell us your story and how it has landed you in the field, in the area of work that you're in? I grew up in Milwaukee, the youngest of four. Grew up on the north side of Milwaukee. Um, and this is the 80s and 90s and Attended public education. A lot of busing was happening back then. So, so that means terms, students being bused to other like yeah, schools other, outside their neighborhood. Yeah, yeah, predominantly white uh, communities. Um, and there's a a wooded area. So it's the it, it was the school. It was a parking lot, and it was like two three blocks of wooded area where folks would go. Uh, students would go hang out. We would sneak out doing lunch and just kick it a little bit. Um, some sometimes skip you know, sometimes just hang out after school in there because it was just a place where folks went and uh, students went and hung out. And one day uh, there was a group of us in that in a wooded area with a fake gun. And it was not the serious looking gun, fake guns today. It was like a real fake gun. The next day, I think it was, I'm in sitting in the classroom and a security guard come get me in the classroom pull me out and say, hey, started talking to me about a gun. And I don't know what the hell he's talking about because his tone was like a real gun. I'm not even drawing a connection to when we were kicking it in the woods. I'm not drawing any connection. So I didn't realize what they were talking about till I got, I got into the principal's office and two police officers are in there. And they throw me in handcuffs, tell me the details. I say, listen, that's a fake gun. I, I told them where it was at. It was at home. I told them where it was at. They, they took me, they put me in handcuffs and took me away and locked me up in deten the detention center. They expelled me from the school. Um, wait, 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 so this is over allegations around a toy gun that was yeah, in the woods near school yeah. that you were arrested and expelled? Yeah, I'm expelled immediately. No, um, you know, and I was expelled and I was placed in an alternative. I, I spent maybe two, three days in a detention center. In this alternative school where, alternative schools in Milwaukee at that time, you had some folks who were really trying, but they were under-resourced and they were seeing some of the worst um, teachers. And I, maybe not worse, but teachers with the poorest records. <laughs> that, that became my new peer group and it spilled over, we kicked it. We started hanging out in the, but this became my new peer group. Meanwhile, my mother working full time. But by the time I was 18 years old, I was arrested for first degree intentional homicide party to the crime, first degree reckless endangering the safety party to the crime. Um, this was during the OJ trial, um, when I was going to trial. 
and I was just really understanding a lot more about race and and whatnot. But um, I had two trials. First trial ended in a mistrial. Second trial, I had a, an all white jury, and it was. And again, this was at this was at the height of the O.J. Simpson trial and the racial divide that was being exposed, not new, but exposed. And I recall one of the jurors, jurors were trying to she was trying to exclude herself from um, doing it. And the judge asked why. She said I was on a highway one day and I cut off the this group of black guys and I cut them off. And I think she said she gave him the finger and they caught up with her and like threw a soda out the window and it splattered off. She's like graphic and all the people on the jury, in the jury pool, they're like looking all sad and like sympathizing. And then she was like, and they never got caught. And it felt like in that moment, they looked that the energy was like, this one won't get away though. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I'm there paranoid. Like, I'm I like, man, this is it, you know? So um, meanwhile, I get found uh, guilty. And I always say I'm not innocent in terms of like I fell off into the streets. You talking about the nineties in Milwaukee, like, you know what I mean? But I I was not guilty of this particular um uh case. While in prison, um, I began to educate myself. My class my cell truly became a classroom. Mm -hmm. Um, I ordered books and I can say it now, but I we can only have a limit on books in prison. So I started building libraries and other guys sell that didn't read and just have my people send them books. Wait, what was the maximum of books you were supposed to? 25 publications. Through that reading, I started to really discover how resilient and beautiful and how much genius um, black people hold. And, and growing up in education, I always got the slave story. Right. But even with that slave story, I got this as victims. And like knowledge became like it, it became like innate like this is a part of who we are you know what I mean and this is stuff I never learned um and again even when we got to slavery the story was different like how much genius and resilience it took to survive mm -hmm. and the, even in some instances thrive when the world was set up to crush you and make you feel less than. I learned about why we went from Africans to Negroes. And when you rob people of their names, then you can define who they are. And so it was just so much stuff that I was learning during that time. And I began to really realize, truly realize that, that, that our ignorance is weaponized against us. It helps you to, 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 to have this intimate relationship with your humanity. And when you know you're a human, you're not gonna accept slavery or oppression. And it's similar to today, when we know what we're truly worth, we're not gonna accept. So just that education piece became critical, but not a white-centered education. I was gonna yeah. say, because when people hear the word education, yeah. a certain idea comes to mind. The assumption is like, oh, well, we have education. Mm -hmm. But as you've already pointed out, like what type of education, what sort of messaging is that education communicating to black students? And if it's reinforcing this negative narrative, then how is that gonna make that student feel empowered in your classroom, right? So like a stereotype threat is a thing. It's an absolute thing, right? How is that causing me to view myself in a way that is empowering, that I can then perform well? Or is it feeding these like defeatist victim mentalities to me so I don't even think that I can. And I'm so hard trying to disprove this idea that I can't, that I'm underperforming, right? So like, yeah, overhauling education and just confronting how we go about it, like absolutely, like who is it serving? Mm -hmm. And if it's not equally serving everyone, then what needs to change? Like, like the prison system is a cemetery of, of some of the best talent in the world, just sitting there. And a lot of these men would rediscover writing and, and music and philosophy and just deep, deep stuff. Well, let me ask you this because in and thank you, like yeah, yeah. your story, I feel like you could get a movie, docu-series, something. Make it happen, let's, let's get it. <laughs> I mean, we are a media company. I was like, I can't do that, wait a minute. <laughs> yes, you can. We can, we can talk about that. No doubt. But um, I'm thinking about like, those who are listening to this and are thinking like, okay, we start off talking about like his time in school, and then we talked about your time in, within the criminal justice system. And I wanted to elevate why it's so important to talk about those two systems being connected because they, one feeds the other. My school to prison pipeline started in middle school when they said, get out. 
that changed the trajectory of my life. When I went to, got kicked out of that middle school and went to that alternative school, the streets became a part of who, yeah, like they, they said, get out and you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So that story started in, in middle school as it often does with young people. Part of the work that I do also, not only work, I mainly work with adults and work with adults around um, uh, race and racism and things. And it can be anything from curriculum to development to building just and equitable learning environments, but also contract with the, um, a part of one of my contracts is working with the young people in the juvenile system right here downtown um, in JR, JRC. And I'm seeing the same thing in terms of like smart, gifted, in unique ways that don't fit the mold of, but like, and you just want to like, how do we pull these resources and get them what they need? Our young people spend more time in in these schools. Yes. And and their their reality of themselves and the world is getting shaped. And and education is like it's always been. It's like a serious hit or miss. You don't show up with all the answers. You show up, you yes. listen to the people, they give you all their thoughts, their wisdom jumbled all up. And your job as a revolutionary is to go and organize that knowledge and wisdom and give it back to the people. And I think that's I the same that. relationship that has to be done with young people where you have to show up expecting them to teach you some things. Mm-hmm. Cause they're going mm-hmm. to teach us like a parent and a child. That child is going to teach you how to be a father. You don't have to have all the answers. You just need to pay attention to what how, yeah, yeah, and it's the same with education, but it's really difficult because if you're a, a educator and you're you're, you're 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 showing up with all this bias that that society have, uh, when you think about white supremacy culture, it's the air we breathe, the water we swim in. So we're we've all internalized that, but you show up in a classroom and you've not done any of your own identity work, and you're showing up with this, and then. The district is constantly pounding data in your head about how black kids cannot learn. And then they say, go into class and change and teach black kids. So you have to have some very deep and intentional unpacking. And I feel like sometimes it's not even data that specifically says that, but it's the comparisons, right? So if you're saying, oh, that black students are performing in this way by comparison to white students, that's setting up white students as the norm by which everyone else is then expected to level up with that's the very epitome of white supremacy because if you're the norm you're the superior right you know what i mean Mm -hmm. and if you're not learning in that dominant way if you're not fitting into that cookie cutter approach to education then that's why that's how so many people end up in prison with such deep intelligence but they may learn in unique ways again people of color um specifically speaking for myself as a black person we internalize this stuff as well so we have to continue to do our own work the struggle is we're expected to do the work of teaching um white folks right and then also doing our own healing you know what Mm -hmm. i mean and that's been a consistent theme in all these conversations that i've had today Mm -hmm. is that like there are folks like you who are in the field doing the work but that doesn't absolve you from needing to like manage your own stuff. I mean, you've had like a super traumatic like experience for decades. Like, so you're still having to deal with aspects of what that still means for you on top of how you're pouring into other people and trying to fix like this corrupt system or a system. So yeah. And and, and the daily chipping away of, of, of micro traumas. I mean, I had to create space for myself because I, I, I was carrying a story of institutionalization. And for me, it freaked me out to start seeing the same fear that I saw in the prison system uh, amongst staff who wanted to treat, um, quote unquote, inmates more humane and how they would be scrutinized. And I show up in education. I did not get that level of fear. And I would it, it really shocked me and not from a place of judgment, from, but from a place of like. How is this living? But that is. That is capitalistic white supremacy culture, where it thrives off of keeping people in place. Education is more about complying than um, really um, helping students to become critical thinkers. 
And when you're focused on compliance, that stuff, it, it, it trickles down. So the principal is complying with the school district. The school district is complying with the board. And then the teachers feeling like they don't have power. So their classroom becomes their only place of power. So then now they have to get compliant. And that, that energy around that, it makes it extremely difficult to have like those just and equitable learning environments. So how can we make sure the well-being of everyone is centered and how do we make that a part of the curriculum? Like how do we turn that into lessons? Because one thing that George Floyd and all this other stuff that's happening, that's all curriculum. And it's what's in pack, it's what we're carrying. Right. So we can create healing environments that, that where education is anchored into the reality of what we're grappling with, but it's also led with hard work. But right, it's still that headiness head and you know, and I it, it's, it's, folks are burnt out. I love like everything as you just said, yeah. and especially like the emphasis on how we can reimagine. Cause there's mm -hmm. been, since we've gone virtual, like there's been like little catchphrases about what, what what's the reimagining of education and what's it gonna mm -hmm. look like that's different. And you're right, but it's, it's, it's catchphrasy to say that, but it's easier to default to what's familiar. So I feel like some folks there are trying is. to transition, but that's hard to do when the system is structured in a very specific way that this is how education works. But I am seeing like more conversations about how are we centering social emotional needs and mm -hmm. social and emotional learning such that we're not ignoring the realities of our students and our families and our staff in this point in history on top of like, we gotta figure out online learning. Oh yeah, and it's COVID. Oh yeah, and all the other things, right? We can't ignore like that human side of people, which you've already too talked about. Mm -hmm. So if we keep ignoring cell, then that's not going to serve, right? Those who were trying to mm -hmm. And sell educate. For, for, sell for not only students, but adults. Right, like adults we treat so like it's just- <laughs> Yeah, like, like it's for right. a- uh, right community but the, the 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 threat to radically reimagining anything is are the human the conditioning around going back to what you're familiar with people would prefer a familiar slavery than an unfamiliar freedom because it's what they're they know you know what i mean even though it's dysfunctional as hell there's comfort in that dysfunction because yeah, at least I know what yeah, it is. Yeah. And that is the biggest threat, but that's the biggest threat to any ch like mm -hmm. real fundamental revolutionary change is you have to conquer that inclination to go to what you're familiar with, especially with when what's familiar is not um, benefiting the whole community. So again, you've highlighted the issues around school to prison pipeline. You gave your own personal story of how that started off. And I hope people understood that entry point and what that looked like and how it just escalated over time and then kind of how that culminated for you. But one of the things I did want to elevate because you've mentioned men quite a few times is the plight for black girls in particular. Um, and there are books like Pushed Out that are trying to call attention to, hey, there's this issue. But again, it's not being spoken about. So that's something you can speak to briefly before we close. Thank you for um, elevating that. It's just, it's, it's, it's still that old belief that is just the threat to black males. But I'm in education. Black girls are being criminalized. It's an adultification of black girls. You can have, I've witnessed it, you can have a group of white female students running down the hall. And it's symbolic and people wouldn't bat an eye, but you have a group of black girls running down the hall and it's just, you know, ring the alarm. And that's symbolic. It's a small thing, but it's symbolic. But we have got, I, I work with young, our young sisters, particularly, I just, we just had our last, they're quarantining in JRC and our last two students were black, black girls, struggling, like wanting to do good wanting to do great things, but society is mean on our black girls. And they are being made to feel that they are not smart enough, they're not pretty enough. And some of it happens within the family, some of it happens through media, some of it happens um, through school, but they internalize that. And there's a phenomenon in, in, in education where black girls are fighting and they don't understand where it's coming from. But what you internalize, you externalize, particularly on those who, if you've been made to feel like you're not pretty enough, you're not smart enough, 
and you begin to develop some stuff. And I'm not talking about all because some of our little sisters is just like they get it. They get it. But there are some of our little sisters, they're, they're, they're suffering in deep ways. And instead of folks asking um, what happened, they're asking what's wrong with you. Exactly. You know what I mean? It's like that, that lack of recognition around how trauma, however that's manifested, maybe contributing to what you're seeing in the classroom. Yeah, it like, definitely is. And how that's then leading to other sorts of issues in school, yeah. which could then land you in the juvenile justice system and that could just accelerate yeah. from there. And to be treated as a young person, to be treated as an adult mm -hmm. or like treat young people like whole human beings, but give them space to develop. Um, when you're made to believe, where people treat you as if what is happening in your life you deserve, you begin to believe that. It's, and then that, that, that just creates this sparrow, but thank you for lifting that up um, and checking my patriarchy in the process because it is, it is, and I need that, I need that. But I and and I, and it's not like I'm blind to it because I see it. I've checked other people about it when they say our black boys, our black boys. No, our black girls are suffering now, and it's about creating healing spaces for them and 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 allowing them excuse me, allowing them to co-create these spaces. Um, like you said before, not coming in with the solutions and the hero cape on, right, right. but saying, what do you need and what would you like to create that then provides right. what is it you need? Yeah, for sure. Wow. Well, thank you for speaking mm -hmm. to that. Definitely didn't want sure. that that piece to go thank unnoticed. Thank you, thank you. I needed that love. I don't know, it's fine because it's this weird kind of juxtaposition of like an invisible hyper visibility mm -hmm. that I think black women and black girls in our state and our city like deal with on a regular basis. Yeah, and you know, absolutely. constantly confronting that I think is what we want, what we want to take place here. So I feel like you've dropped so many nuggets just during our entire time together. So I don't want you to feel like you have to say something that's like a closeout. But if there's anything that you want people watching this to take away from, whether they can relate to your story or not, um, whether they're like, oh, this is like new information for me, I wanna help, or like I've been in this and I'm trying to move the needle and I'm just struggling. Like what, what do you want them to, what do you want them to, to connect with the most? For me, anti-racism work is about tearing down the barriers that gets in the way of us seeing one another humanity. And that work is critical during this time, whether you are 80 year old or you eight years old. I think our mission is a, a onion mission where you're gonna peel, you're gonna peel, you're gonna peel, and you're gonna keep peeling because it's gonna be lifelong work, whether regardless of what your 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 race or your or or sexuality or gender is. And sometimes that onion is gonna make you cry. Like it's gonna make you cry because right when you think you got it. <laughs> and it's another thing shows up and I'm speaking from experience, you know, so. That is so true. This is this work is not a checklist. Mm -mm. It's not a, it's not checkbox work. It's like you said, it's lifelong continuous commitment. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Rudy. For sure. Public education is just that, education for the public. The school to prison pipeline and other disparities within the education system can have huge negative effects on people of color, especially within the black community. A lack of representation in classrooms, administrations, and on school boards is also an issue, one of a list of problems that need solutions. To hear more of Rudy's incredible journey, including how he won his freedom from incarceration, subscribe and listen to our podcast at pbswisconsin.org slash why race matters. There, you can also find links and resources to help keep you informed, as well as additional episodes of Why Race Matters. Funding for Why Race Matters is provided by Puna Mutual Group, Park Bank, Alliant Energy, Madison Museum of Contemporary Art, Focus Fund for Wisconsin Programming, and Friends of PBS Wisconsin.